Okay. <laughs> now, these are just some of the children from the neighborhood. Uh, many of them are like 70 years old now. <laughs> this is uh, maybe some people that you're familiar with. Uh, Daryl Newton. You familiar with Oh, that? yeah. Yep. This is Daryl when he was a little guy. This is Daryl. Oh, I recognize him. <laughs> this is James Bradley. And the reason that I point those two out, because, you know, they've done some other things, uh, you know, other than be a little kid. You know, Daryl, he's been active in the NAACP for probably 30 years. And James Bradley went on to have quite an entertainment career. Uh, up here, you've got, you know, kids from the neighborhood. These are kids from the neighborhood. Uh, this is me when I was a little kid. Which one were you again? This is me, and that's my little sister, Pearl. Uh, somebody else that you're proud of. Kids. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's the Sisson guys. That's uh, Gene, Steve, and Jerry. This is my house when I was growing up. And across the street was United Carbide. My buddy Russ swears that they had something going on that was secret because he never saw anybody go in there. And the, the, I guess the outcome of what they were doing over there was a lot of like carbon pieces. Russ always says, nah, they were over there doing something underhanded, you know, they had something going on. It's conspiracy. What we came up with is we do a pictorial so that it would force people to engage. You know, people that knew each other that just didn't talk, it would force them to engage with each other just by virtue of these photographs. This kind of thing. See, this was the first time that you had brown kids who are going to proms now. This is in the 60s. The ones that graduated in the 50s, they don't know anything about going to a prom. This stuff over here, this is what I was referring to. That Russell Davis and I, see, we came through sixth grade. Here we are as athletes when we were younger. But we're all coming from that same North Ward community. Now, this is like middle school. I think I have one that shows what we did in high school. And this was a, the biggest way that you were going to get any kind of recognition was playing sports. Because when I was growing up, we had four mediums for communication. The radio, the TV, the newspaper, or a magazine. And if you didn't appear in one of those, nobody knew about you. But these were some of the early great athletes. You got Naaman Smith. This is George Archer when he was playing. Then I got a couple of pictures of Connell Berry when I was playing. See, we were playing that Team Northern. And that's the photograph that you'll see at Bay City Central. But we had lots of really good football teams. You're playing Flint Central here? We're playing Flint Northern here. See, that was one of the greatest games that they ever had in Bay City.
they have four games listed. I think ours was number one. Yeah, 1967. And then late, later, this guy, that's Naaman, that's his son, Terry. Terry broke his father's records when he became a high school football player. Naaman Smith was a state champion, sprint champion in 100 meters. His son was the state uh, 100 meters champion. About, no, oh, it must have been about 30 years later. But these are some of the things that would allow you to stand out. You can make an impression. Uh, like I said, name recognition because of my association with football. I can remember newspaper reporters telling me after they saw me in my clothes is, hey, man, you're a little guy. I thought you were much bigger out there. But yeah, well, I hope the other team thought I was bigger too. <laughs> but those are some of the things, and this was part of our education. Uh, once again, some of these guys, they had like part of their education was one place and then they finished here. It was Russ Davis, Connell, Richard Bean. Ours was all from here to the end of it. So we, we kind of fit into that mode. We had the same training, the same exposure. The rest was just talent. They, you had Lonnie Lowry. See, and Lonnie came back. He became a teacher at Bay City Central. He was my uh, freshman football coach. John Smith. John Smith came back. He became like a teacher. But and he, uh, handy. <laughs> yeah. See, and he spent all the rest of his years right here in Bay City, whereas most of the guys that had been educated... Lonnie came back for a while, and then he moved to Lansing, and he's been in Lansing ever since. George came back. George stayed until probably 1974, so he stayed for 10 years, and then he moved to Lansing, and he never came back. But initially, they helped see what was going to happen thereafter. This person here, uh, Denise Gibson Tieska. Which one? Right here. See, now her story is a little different. She was an athlete. She was probably the first black girl that graduated from Bay City Central and went on to college. And I think Denise probably has a doctor's degree now. But it was going to be a little tougher for her because it's all academic. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with the sports. But, you know, John was an excellent track guy. He had one phrase, and I always remember that. John said his biggest desire was to never bring shame or embarrassment to his family, and that was his motivation. And I said, you know, John, that's pretty good. I never want to bring shame or embarrassment to my family. You know, because once you start and people recognize who you are, you have to take the bitter with the sweet. If you go out there and do something bad, they're going to talk about that as well. So you got to keep all that in mind. And that always resonated with me. John also was one of the guys who looked out for me when I got ready to go to college. Because I can talk about, you know, some of the negative racism that ex existed from whites here in, in uh, Bay City. But the same thing existed with black people, too. There were some black people in town. They were part of the crab system. If they saw you doing something, they want to pull you down so that you don't get too far ahead of them. And that John was the guy who, when I got ready to go to college, the NAACP never gave me a scholarship or anything. And he thought that that was wrong. So I don't know to this day whether John just took that money out of his pocket because it was shameful that the NAACP had kind of uh, diss me, so to speak, when I'd done more in this community than most of those kids that they actually gave money to. To this day, I am not an NAACP supporter in the music business. 
We've got uh, the girls, they did the I've Been Lonely Too Long. They redid the Young Rascals uh, song back in the 60s. Uh, then you had James Bradley. James Bradley started out here in Bay City with the James Bradley Review. And the thing about James Bradley is right here. See, James Bradley and the girls were the first groups that were mixed. You know, you had white guys in the band and the girls sang, and James had, you know, white guys in his band as well. But this is the changing of the guard. This is in like 1966, 67, 68. So things are starting to change a little bit in Bay City. Uh, Albie Burt. See, Albie was a heck of an athlete, too, when he was at Bay City Central. He was state champions in 1969. But Albie started really early. He was in the Uptown Band. That was the only local band that we had, you know, as far as minorities were concerned. The house parties, the blue light in the basement parties, Albie and Carrie and Junior Lewis. This is Junior up here. He used to play the... Uh, he still does. He plays the keyboard, but back in the day, he played the piano. But that was the first young group that we had here in Bay City. And then uh, we had some other accomplished people in the music business. Mabel Dangerfield, she used to sing on the radio. You know, she was a, a gospel singer. Uh, then later on, my nephew, Vincent, this guy here, See, he had a couple of hit records that he had. He was like a songwriter. Well, he is a songwriter. And uh, he had a record that was stolen from him uh, by Jay. And there was this long, drawn-out suit. But uh, in the end, Vincent got paid his royalties because it was his song. That song now uh, was re-recorded by Boney James. So, you know, he did... Uh, a hell of a job in terms of what he had to work with. He had a couple of gold records, one of which was in Dale's place. So he donated it to Dale with the girls because Dale had a picture of the girls and then this gold record that Vince had. These were some of the local uh, gospel singers. Let's see who we got there. We got Naaman Smith. We got Willie Smith. We got Osa Lee King. We got Russell Smith. And I don't know who handsome is on the end there. <laughs> I can't think of who he is. But then Benson was associated with this group here, Dream Boy. Dream Boy in the early 80s. They were a popular young band. But those were people who made contributions outside of athletics. Most of the guys, like I mentioned, Lonnie and George and myself and John and Rich, we were all athletes, and that was our claim to fame. But the business folks, this is R.J. Patterson. Uh, I actually wrote an article about him because there was so much that I thought Bay City missed. See, that's the best photograph that I could get of him. He fought in World War I. Imagine what it was like for him as a soldier, a black soldier in 1917. And this is his family. That's his youngest daughter with the sunglasses and his oldest daughter, family. And the bottom picture is their mom. And then there were businesses in town. Uh, the Bay City Times gave them a shout out. That's, uh, I know that's Reuben Adams, I think Tim Sweet. Uh, I never did know this fella, <laughs> but he must have had a business. Uh, he had Henry Rowan, he had a barbershop business. You had uh, Nadrin Jones's mother, she had a beauty salon.
This looks like Defoe Shipbuilding here. It is. See, now Defoe Shipbuilding was right in the midst of uh, the North End. You know, it was a fairly big employer. And I remember working at Defoe. I was a pipe fitter's helper. And I'd crawl around in the bottom of the boats and I thought, man, all those pipes and stuff, I thought they were pre-done. Never knew how they got there. You know, the pipe fitter actually took a straight pipe and we bent them to fit whatever direction they needed to go. And it was an interesting proposition, as well as what Defoe did. Defoe launched their boat sideways. You know, and it was a sight to see. I remember I got my buddy in trouble. We were in second grade, and I was telling Russ about, hey, man, let's go down and watch the boat launch at Defoe. He said, we can't go. We got to go to school. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do, what we can do, Russ. We went to school that morning. You know, you get out at 12 for lunch. And I said, we won't go back. See, so they'll know that we came to school, and nobody will know the difference. We'll go over and watch the boat launch. And so we did. And he was fascinated in seeing that boat slide off there sideways. But when Russell got home, his mother told him, he said, she asked him the question, Russ, how was school today? He said, oh, it was good. She said, no, it wasn't Mr. Thomas, who was the principal, had already called. So my buddy got spanked for that. Well, it wasn't no spanking. You got whooped for that. And it was a lesson for me. Never do anything to get your friends in trouble. Never encourage them to do anything bad, you know. And it hurt me that he got spanked for that. Well, he got whipped for that. But I knew then, I said, I didn't think it all the way through. You had a phone. I didn't. See, they couldn't call my mom, but they could call his. But I remember that for a lifetime. Never get your friends in trouble. Man. He trusted me, and see, and I got him in trouble. But it was a learning experience. You know, we were in second grade, and from second grade to now. I've always kept that close to the best. I, I never wanted to do things to get my friends in trouble. And then, you know, we got uh, Dale's place there, Bare Bones. He's like the new guy on the block. He had the Bare Bones barbecue place. See, and then all of that, all these years, all these years, there's probably been five or six entrepreneurs in Bay City, brown people. You know, the kids came along behind them and they didn't have the business acumen. And as a result, a guy like R.J. Patterson, who had so much, he didn't actually train his children to take over his empire. And they just kind of pissed it away, his two sons. And now there's nothing there. There's not even a brick there that said, R.J. Patterson, you know, was the first big-time entrepreneur uh, of color in Bay City. Hotels gone, bars gone, pool gone. Everything that he had there is all gone. And what you see is the bar that was most inclined to take a photograph. See, that's Blue Ribbon Bar in that corner. You're going to see lots of photographs where people are standing in that corner. You can see that photograph. That's an old Polaroid. And you know, you, you take the picture and you, you rip the thing off later. See, and this too. See, that's Blue Ribbon Bar. Where was the Blue Ribbon located exactly? Right across the street from Pat's. That's why it was called like Two Corners. And my daughter put that on there, <laughs> Two Corners. <laughs> but this is Pat's Bar, I mean, Blue Ribbon Bar. This is in Blue Ribbon Bar, like I said. If you look at most of these photographs, see, they're all taking it in the same spot. And there are all these old Polaroids. That's Ali's father, Ali Smith. Okay. <laughs> this is my brother. He's quite the guy. <laughs> Lonnie Berry Jr. Older, younger? Oldest. He's my oldest brother. Died first. How many brothers did you have? I had three brothers. There was actually nine of us. There was four guys and five girls. Hmm. Uh, 
now there is uh, two of my sisters have passed away and then my oldest brother. So there's six of us still left. What were their names? Uh, my oldest brother was Lonnie Berry Jr. My oldest sister was Eva Berry, James Berry, Lee Berry, Adeline King, but it was Berry when she got married, Connell Berry, Pearl Berry, Brenda Berry, and Anita Berry. Wow. Yeah, a bunch of kids, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have to worry about no fights because I had somebody at every level. <laughs> But yeah, it was a it was a good time growing up in Big City. See, we didn't we didn't have a yeah, I'm gonna lose. but we didn't have a lot of weddings at the time. So you didn't have much to, to go on. But this was the first wedding with all the pomp and stance that I attended. That's Naaman Smith's wedding. That was the night. You in the picture? Yeah. Am I in a picture? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. I'm right there. That's Russell Davis. That's Naaman Smith. That's George Archer. That's Lonnie Berry, my brother, oldest brother. And that's Alonzo Smith. See, what you, what you sense is, see, there's a lot of family members that are always a part of these kinds of uh, activities. Uh, oh, this is my way. This is like five years after that. But those are weddings of uh, like people in the, in the neighborhood. Once again, just for conversation so that, you know, when we had these pictorials, people could walk up here and they could remember when. Yeah, I remember when that happened. I haven't seen that picture in 30 years. Yeah, some mm -hmm. of them probably 50 years. <laughs> and this guy right here, is Eugene Sisson. Eugene Sisson has been like the guy who captured everything that happened in the first war in the North End from probably 1978 until present. He was kind of like the keeper of the, of the goods. And he certainly, you know, he's earned recognition as somebody who tried to do something in the community. To, to ensure that things were captured. Because when we were kids, you know, we didn't have no cameras. We had one guy, his name was Sam Jenkins. Sam Jenkins used to take all the photographs, all the photographs. If you got dressed up and you wanted a photograph, Mr. Jenkins was the guy to take your picture. And we had to show you a couple of pictures of Mr. Jenkins. City's first, first time African-Americans did something that they hadn't done before. Okay, this girl, first African American to win the Miss Bay County pageant. This guy, first African American drum major at Bay City Central, is Bob McDaniels. Him. This lady here, Leslie Tunstall, first homecoming queen, African-American homecoming queen at Bay City Center. This lady, Deborah Davis, she was the first black lady to even run in the pageant. <laughs> we know a little bit about him. Baker was the first black state candidate. This guy here, now this is in the, in the 70s, early 70s, Charlie Davis, the first black guy that was on the police force. This guy here, that's Connell Berry. I got a chance to be the first black guy who represented our team at the homecoming. And this guy, Paul Carradine, he was the first guy that got an award over at General Motors. You know, you used to have the suggestion award. He was the first guy of color that got anything from that.
Now, this girl winning that was something. <laughs> She's going to Bay City Central. We got, when we may have had 25 black students out of 3,000. So that means that she's got to beat all these girls. This one in particular, <laughs> a Debbie Fetty. See, now her boyfriend at the time was, I don't know whether you ever heard of him, but he was quite an athlete here. His name was Dennis Wagowski. Now, Wagowski used to own the bar down there on the corner, Washington and uh, Columbus. Uh, he was a professional football player. Probably the best athlete to come out of Bay City was uh, Dennis Rogowski. See, Ed Smith. Ed Smith started in the Little League in 1958. He umpired Little League for 25 years. 1983, I think, is when he retired. He spent all those years, he never had a kid. But he got to know all the kids in town. You know, and this is like, we're talking about what was happening in the early 50s and 60s like that. Ed was kind of like a conduit for little white kids who weren't familiar with black people. They knew Eddie from Little League as they grew up. See, and even when, we were, when I was playing football and he was always there with me, he knew all the other kids too from Little League. And they, you know, referred to him lovingly as Big Eddie. But he did all of that. And I, when I came back to Michigan, I went out to the Northeast Little League to see if there was a brick or plaque or anything. They recognized that guy's accomplishment. Nothing. Nothing. That man had nothing to gain by doing that. All he did was make it a little easier for the two races to come together. You know, you, you run into a guy like Eddie, big lovable guy, he's not threatening, even though physically he, he would have been threatening, but he was such a nice guy. See, and that made it a little easier for, you know, Caucasians to say, hey, maybe he, they're like Eddie. And so I always tip my hat to Ed Smith for doing what he did, for being like the surrogate father to me and everything that I did. You know, he's always there to support me, uh, whether it was in middle school or high school. He was always there. And for that, I think he warrants some kind of recognition. But that's that piece that I said I wanted to make sure that we got something on record that Ed Smith actually lived here. Now, Ed Smith is John Smith's brother. That's his oldest brother. See, this is him when I'm graduating from Michigan State. And I think this is like the graduation ceremonies. And this is him, you know, doing some social stuff. We'd have parties in the neighborhood and stuff, different groups. But yeah, Ed Smith, great person. 